Coronavirus is testing even the world's most sophisticated health systems, so there's real concern about how poorer nations will cope with mass outbreaks. How can the developing world deal with COVID-19? This is Roundtable. Africa should wake up. That was the warning recently from the head of the World Health Organization as coronavirus continues to spread. Poorer nations are not being spared, and there's concern that badly funded healthcare systems could be overwhelmed. Coronavirus is spreading rapidly across the globe. Thousands of people have already died in rich nations like China, Italy, Spain, the US and the UK. And thousands more are expected to be infected and die from the disease. Many countries have gone into partial or full lockdown in an attempt to prevent the spread of the disease, closing schools, workplaces and shops. And countries which are home to some of the poorest people in the world, like India, Nigeria and Zimbabwe, have followed suit. But the social and economic impact on the poorest communities could be extreme. Cases of infection are rising in less wealthier nations like Congo, Bangladesh, Afghanistan and Vietnam. The global charity Oxfam has called for richer nations to deliver a $160 billion aid and debt relief. As many poorer nations have weaker healthcare systems, people live in crowded conditions including slums. Three billion people in the world lack basic hand-washing facilities. One humanitarian chief has warned that failing to help vulnerable nations fight the coronavirus now could put millions at risk and leave the virus free to circle back around the globe. Joining us at the round table, we have Michelle Kahn, who's Associate Professor of Health Policy and Systems at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We have Anthony Costello, who's the former Director of Maternal and Child Health at the World Health Organization, now Professor of Global Health at UCL. And we have Camilla Knox Peebles, who is the Chief Executive of Amreth Health Africa UK. Thank you all very much for being on the programme today. So let me start with you, Anthony Costello, if I may. Uh, as somebody who has formerly worked for the World Health Organization, you have a global view. What could we be facing in the developing world? How will it be facing up to coronavirus? Well, it could be a disaster. And uh, I think everyone is extremely worried right now about the situation, particularly for uh, South Asia and for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we don't know exactly the position uh, we're in with the epidemic because almost everything that you need to know about it, we're not sure about because of the potential lack of testing. But there are many issues that... Uh, countries that have done well have managed to tackle that I think will be extremely difficult for many of the uh, African countries uh, and also even for India and some of the other South Asian states. Um, so I am very worried and um, we could talk a little bit about the, the things that we need to, to do in order to get control of this virus, to suppress it uh, and also at the same time to try and keep the economy going. Uh, we've got to have tests that work and which will be very difficult to roll out in many uh, poorer countries. Um, are they going to be able to trace contacts? Uh, many people will find difficulty in quarantining themselves or in uh, achieving social distancing, which is a major policy for countries trying to tackle this. And then there are many other issues relating to the health service, uh, the, the availability and use of personal protective equipment, um, whether or not the country's got any ventilators at all is almost a problem for the very sick. Uh, and then there are other effects such as food security and potentially huge economic impacts on these countries. Well, there's quite a lot to unpick there. Camilla, your organisation works on the ground in several developing countries. What is your organisation seeing? So currently we're seeing um, a health system in many um, African countries but hugely overwhelmed. There's already a huge shortage of healthcare workers. 
at the best of time. Africa has, as a continent, a quarter of the world's disease burden and only 3% of health workers. So it's having to rely also highly on um, informal volunteers, community health workers, in order to both spread information um, about how to prevent disease, but also on what to do if you do present symptoms um, of the coronavirus. So what we're seeing is already stretch health systems, stretch even further, um, and, and panic as um, in many countries, they're seeing what's happening in the north and seeing that we are struggling with protective, uh, personal protective equipment and staff as well, and wondering how are they going to cope. And Michelle, I wonder if you could uh, talk us through what you see as being the particular challenges of developing countries dealing with this. I think we've heard that perhaps uh, uh, having the space to isolate from friends and neighbours <coughs> is something that's virtually impossible in many places. Talk us through what you think developing countries may struggle with. Yeah, well, in addition to some of the important points um, that have been mentioned, so on the socioeconomic side, it's lack of access to water and sanitation when people are um, being asked to um, be at home and, and be under um, lockdown, as we're calling it, people being daily wage earners, loss of income, um, access to nutrition. And then on the health system side, in addition to the, the lack of human resources and, say, equipment, a huge issue in many countries is the poor governance around um, the private healthcare providers, so some of which might be um, stepping up in good faith and that others actually are for-profit providers and, and might not be um, following guidelines. And then, for me, a real concern is the mixing of people at, say, informal drug sellers, which is often a first uh, port of call when you've got a just a it just starts with a cough, really, doesn't it? And and what might happen uh, when these informal and um, often not completely uh, trained healthcare providers are are be being asked for guidance from individuals? We do developing countries necessarily have the healthcare systems that are ready to cope with this? Do they have the ventilators, for example? Do they have the infrastructure? I don't think anyone would say yes to that, and, and I would I would really um, urge people. It's it's not just the the ventilators, but it's having the trained staff. If we ask ourselves when was the last time some of the doctors or nurses had the benefit of any continuing medical education or up to date training, um, personal protective equipment. So it's it's many many things, and I would actually caution against just looking at one element, which is ventilators, which is incredibly important, but also is there an ambulance service? Um, what are we going to do about people that are coming with a cough but that don't have COVID, the mixing um, of, of, of patients at overcrowded healthcare facilities? So it's, it's, um, it's a huge issue that, that, that's quite complex. Anthony, I can see you're, you're nodding there. What's your view? Yeah, I think health worker safety is going to be a, a huge issue. Um, as uh, my colleagues have already said, that you know the, the coverage of health workers in many countries is already very low. Access to hospital beds is very low. But um, the, the other problem is that a lot of the health workers are going to get sick. Even in London, we're finding that uh, in, in one health authority, up to a third of health workers were going off sick, worried about or worried about their children and their, their family. So this, is, this virus is almost designed to hit in every possible way the vulnerabilities of, of health systems. The only one glimmer of hope that I think is there for uh, that many of the, the poorer countries in the South is that, by and large, they're younger populations. And uh, it, we've certainly found from the epidemic so far that most people in their younger, in, uh, you know, below the age of 30, will have a relatively mild disease. And it's the elderly people, particularly over the age of 70, uh, who who really struggle and where the mortality rate is much higher. So it is possible that in younger populations, they're going to be able to ride the, the, the wave of this epidemic and build herd immunity. But um, on the other hand, uh, younger people in, in some of these countries are, are malnourished, and that may also be a, a risk factor for a worse outcome. And Camilla, what, what do you think? Do you th do, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think absolutely. Um, as Anthony 
there, there is a glimmer of hope with the young. I think they're also um, contributing to the whole effort of trying to um, re reduce the spread. So a lot of the community health workers, for example, that AMREF is training, and this is alongside Ministry of Health in a number of different countries in Africa, are young people who are volunteering a couple of hours of their time to, um, to spread the information about uh, the virus and, um, and some of the risks and trying to um, engage people on some of the misinformation that is also out there and dispel some of those uh, myths around the virus. But um, I think up until now, community health workers have not been part of the formal health system in most African in countries in Africa. And obviously, AMREF works in Africa, so I'm speaking from that perspective. Um, so um, having them recognize their work recognized, having making sure they're paid and they're protected is going to be critical. And, um, and governments from the <coughs> north work together with countries in Africa to ensure that is, is, is essential as well. If I might add it, I think just to say that I completely agree with the other's points and in that re respect, then getting the balance right between um, not um, t diverting too much attention also away from the ex existing um, health issues and making sure that there's uh, continuity of services, because you can imagine if, if we're optimistic and COVID-19 isn't as bad, we don't also want to look back and think that the disruption and the, the excess deaths caused um, from other um, illnesses that were not managed during this period was, was what actually um, uh, you know, caused the most harm in these settings. Um, if you look at countries around the world tackling this right now, uh, they fall into two groups in terms of the ones that have done pretty well to suppress the virus. And the two, by and large, the strategies uh, are around testing for the virus and social distancing. Now, the Asian states like Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and even China have managed to get the virus suppressed through lockdowns, but also mass testing programs. And they moved with speed, which is what the WHO has always recommended to get in there fast. The European countries didn't do that, and they have had a kind of half-hearted approach to social distancing. And my own country in the UK is not actually doing mass testing. And their death rates are way, way higher than um, the countries uh, in Asia that have managed to get this damped down and now are looking to loosen up their economy. Now, the problem in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and India is that it's almost impossible to do social distancing uh, because they're living in cramped conditions and it's very difficult for people to maintain that level of distancing. So you're going to get high levels of spread and they can't test. But the one thing we should mention is the indirect economic effects. Um, the Ghanaian Minister of Foreign Affairs yesterday gave an interview saying that this was a break the glass moment for Africa. And, you know, Africa has been actually one of the fastest growing parts of the world economically, but it now could face a drop in its GDP of five to 10 percent. It's going to face big problems with debt because of the fall in their local currencies. Um, commodity prices have gone down. Uh, their, their bonds are at junk status, so it means they can't borrow money except at higher interest rates. We're right back to the kind of debt crisis we had 20 years ago. And there is the real risk there of uh, countries having to deal with mass unrest. And will they have the resources to send out, for example, cash transfers to the poorest families? I think India should be able to cope with that, but I'm not sure about many other countries. So I wonder then, do what can be done about that? Do they have the resources to bounce back? or And should they be looking to European countries to follow their model? Or is it just a case that our mould will not fit developing countries and they need to think of a completely different uh, path to follow in order to fight the spread of coronavirus? I think for me, I would say, you know, doing a copy and paste of 
of models from European countries is just going to be a complete disaster. We've already seen what's happened in India with a mass migration um, owing to the lockdown. People can't, don't have the sort of social protection. Um, you know, the World Bank estimates that 80 percent of people in sub-Saharan Af Africa and South Asia don't have any financial protection in the case of um, a catastrophic illness. So, so what that means is that any kind of disruption to being able to um, to work means that people can't survive. And then, then if you have people having to go back to their villages, as we've seen in India, that's exactly the opposite sort of crowding and, and population movements that we want during um, this time. So so these the strategies really do need to be context specific and led um, by the countries, albeit that the countries are really overwhelmed and there's a huge coordination issue. Camilla, I can see you nodding. What would you, what would you like yeah, to say? Yeah, I was just, I just building on, uh, on the point that is, is really about having a, you know, this is a global challenge and having a global response to it. And I think um, one of the things that we all should be working towards and as Northern governments and beyond is contributing, for example, to the UN COVID-19 emergency appeal. So supporting governments and, and um, agencies and organizations working in these different countries in Africa, in Asia, to be able to respond and prepare now, not wait, learn from what's happened in Europe and, and North America um, and, and China, obviously. So, so they, they, there's a piece around really seeing what can be de done now, but not waiting and working together on this and not seeing our problem in isolation. Um, and I think the other point is, 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 has already been made around social protection. There are, there are systems in place in a number of countries in Africa. They are very basic. You know, you've got the hunger safety net program in Kenya. You've got this, uh, a sa the productive safety net program in Ethiopia. There are systems that could be built on to address some of the social prote protection <coughs> issues. So we're not starting completely from scratch, but they will require a huge investment. And I think we all have a responsibility, um, whether it's from the South or from the North, to come together to support these governments to have less, uh, less financial resource to be able to provide to the uh, poorest and the most marginalized. Just, just to be a little bit more uh, optimistic, um, I understand, I mean, as you know, the Americans have thrown $2 trillion at this in order to stabilize their economy. Uh, the British, I think, are, are planning on something like $400 billion just for our country. Uh, the IMF yesterday apparently contributed and said they would provide $50 billion for Africa. Whether that's going to be enough, I know that the Africans have been asking for more than that to help them to, uh, you know, tide over this difficult period. But one thing I would observe is that over the past 20 years, resilience has built in Africa. There is a lot of entrepreneurial activity. Um, there are better health systems. I mean, the way Nigeria handled Ebola last year was actually an object lesson. They've got um, quite widespread community health worker systems that could help with communicating messages and the like. So, uh, I, you know, it's not the same as 20 years ago. I think um, um, a number of these countries, it will be a huge test for them. But it might surprise us that they are stepping up to the challenge rather better than some of the northern countries. But I wanted to ask you all about Ebola. What lessons were learned during that crisis, do you think? And can any of them be put into play during this one? And how well is that being played out? There's a lot that can be learned um, by higher income countries from some of the other countries. So I think it's really important for us to be humble in, in who we're um, willing to, to learn from. Um, one important lesson from Ebola is the issue of trust and who is trusted, are government authorities trusted, is it religious leaders, um, when it's coming to messages about, say, um, hygiene, um, burial, etc. So really, really important to make sure that some of the key trusted stakeholders in communities are brought on board. I think that's, again, coming back to the community health worker piece. Um, I was... I was working um, and involved in the response to the Ebola crisis in West Africa. 
And one of the key lessons that we learned very, very late was how important it was to have those trusted individuals imparting those messages. The community, trained community health workers who were trusted by the community and able to speak their language, able to understand some of the, the beliefs that they had around the virus, around the disease um, in this particular case, are, well, that was absolutely critical, having that group of people um, informed and able to inform others. There was huge amounts of fear, um, and I think that stopped people reporting symptoms, that stopped people going to the Ebola treatment units, um, because what they saw often is people going to the Ebola treatment units and never returning and not understanding why. So being able to be as informed of, as possible uh, by people you trust, um, it, it was a fundamental lesson from the Ebola crisis. And, and that's the role that community health workers played. I would agree with that. Two really key points. One is speed. Um, you know, the World Health Organization was quite criticized at the the beginning of the you know 2014 Ebola outbreak for being too slow off the mark, and they I think they recognise that now. Um, and so you've got to get in fast. And the other thing is to mobilise communities so that they are sensitised that it's a you know people are giving them messages that are relevant in their context from not from people in you know spacesuits coming in, but uh, to really explain the situation carefully. And if you do that, then you can get a much more positive response from communities. So, uh, I mean, they face formidable challenges, but it may surprise us in some places that they can uh, use their local knowledge to maintain some social distancing, to keep people uh, under some kind of quarantine and to respond in imaginative and creative ways with the communities behind them. What, in your view, has the UK done wrong and what can other countries learn from how it's tackled the coronavirus so far? Well, it's it's been behind the curve and actually it hasn't listened to the World Health Organization, which has said all along, you must do testing, you must do contact tracing, you must do quarantine and social distancing and you must do all of them together and do them fast. And Britain has constantly been slow off the mark. I shouldn't say Britain, I should say the UK, and particularly England and Wales. They've been slow off the mark to get uh, movement going. And at the moment, they're still pursuing a policy which largely is around social distancing. And we've had a national lockdown, which will lead to serious economic effects. But they're not putting into that package the mass testing that I think will be needed to really get control. Uh, and suppression of the virus. So I don't think the UK comes out of this with um, flying colours, frankly. And we're seeing that already in the surge of cases in London and the West Midlands. And uh, I hope that their social distance policy will work. But then how are they going to keep control after they start to loosen up? Michelle, you're nodding. Yeah, I was just saying, um, uh, you know, you were saying they haven't, the, the UK hasn't come out with flying colours. And thinking about some of the, um, the the tools and indices that have been used to measure preparedness. I'm thinking specifically about the Global Health Security Index, where the United States, America was number one and the UK was number two. It does really um, you know, beg questions about how are we measuring how prepared countries are? Who was measuring this? And what elements did we miss out um, that would result in um, you know uh, America getting such a high score when we're seeing such uh, massive issues over there. My answer to that one issue is um, the equity of health systems um, hasn't been um, taken fully into account. There's there's certainly other factors as well, including how much of a voice countries had in their self assessments. But clearly, this is going to raise questions about how um, how we were tracking um, different countries' preparedness. And Michelle, I just want to take you back two years, if I may, when you appeared on an earlier round table programme in which you predicted that there would be a global pandemic. Are you surprised about how quickly you were proved right and how it came to be? Um, I think a lot of people were raising these alarms. Um, to, I, I'm, 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 it, it's really unfortunate at the scale at, um, at which this has happened. 
Um, I think to Auntie's point, if we're trying to be optimistic, countries that have faced um, such situations before, so China with SARS and, and some of the countries that um, faced Ebola have done much better. So I'm hoping that this will mean that in the future, countries that haven't experienced such a crisis before are better prepared. But that will only happen if, if all of us hold up our politicians accountable and ask them what they have done to strengthen health systems um, following this. So I, I, I really hope that the warnings that weren't listened to earlier um, will now, um, you know, now that this issue and health has been raised to such a high political platform that we never go back to putting health quite so low on the priority list of investments. We're out of time, unfortunately, but thank you very much indeed for joining us on Roundtable. Michelle Kahn, Anthony Costello and Camilla Knox Peebles, many thanks. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. But for now, from me and all the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.